Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining uh, this uh, session so late in the afternoon. Um, I'm an absolute greenhorn, so I'm first time uh, at the Linux conference, first time speaker, so, but I'm gonna talk about automating and managing an IoT fleet using Git. First, a few words about me. My name is Matthias Lüscher, and already as a child, I prefer to automate boring stuff like a ball track. So it's utterly boring to operate such a ball track. I instead created an elevator that plays for me. <laughs> and the same holds true for my professional life. So I don't like to do the same job over and over again. So when dealing with IoT devices, I try to automate as much as possible. Um, then another thing I do, uh, instead of attending a lot of courses and earning some training awards, I decided to start my own open source project. It's called EDI, and you will learn a bit more about it during that presentation. So EDI is my private project, it's open source, and uh, at Schindler, we are manufacturing elevators and escalators. Unfortunately, the uh, elevators and escalators in this building are from Kona. What a pity. Um, th that's the big playground for EDI. I live in Switzerland as, and I work as a principal engineer at Schindler. During my spare time, I enjoy the time together out in the nature with my family. So also the the boys, my two boys, they like to go biking, hiking, skiing, whatnot. And if you'd like to contact me, there is the email. Okay, so what's my mission? I would like to automate as much as possible in an IoT environment, including OS image builds, testing, configuration management, and fleet management. We will learn about more about this during this uh, presentation. So we start with continuous integration. The goal is to build an operating system image for an IoT device and dispatch it to a device, to the selected device, and test it all in an automatic manner. Then once we have this operating system image, we can put it on a device, but that's still stupid, so maybe it's a headless device then and we want to turn it into something else that fulfills the use case we need. That's the device management. So, taking care of an individual device. And finally, I prepared a small sample fleet. It's not the big Schindler playground. I prepared a sample fleet where we do a continuous delivery to this fleet. So we keep an entire fleet up to date based on the description we have in Git. So, Let's start with the continuous integration. Again, we would like to build an operating system image for an IoT device that gets automatically dispatched and tested. So, how does this look like? Down here, we have a private network. The devices here down here are on the private network. Uh, up here, we have the internet. And here we have a self-hosted GitHub runner. So how does it start? On GitHub, we enter some values, like we would like to test on this device, uh, what kind of configuration we'd like to test, and of course the ID of that device. Then the job will go to our self-hosted runner. The self-hosted runner will um, fetch some repositories, namely the configuration of our operating system image. Then uh, the build on this Raspberry Pi starts for the operating system image. We fetch, of course, a lot of Debian packages. We fetch them, put them onto the self-hosted runner. And finally, we have an operating system artifact. In my case, it's a Mender artifact, so we upload it to hosted Mender. And finally, we tell Mender, hey, please download this artifact to this test device. 
or let the device, whether to say let the device know that there is a new artifact that we want to dispatch and the device fetches it, does a proper AB update and uh, the new operating system is running here. So no flashing of uh, CF cards and so on. Stuff runs here. And as the second last step, we would like to test. So we run the test suite here, but we would like to test this device. And here we are on the same network. So we can easily go into the device, run some tests here. Uh, in my case, I'm using test infra. And finally, when everything is done, the result goes back to GitHub. And we see here, oh, we have a new operating system image and it paused all the tests. So it's extremely convenient, no manual steps involved. Uh, yeah, let's dig a bit into the details. If you can't read the slides from the back, uh, they're online available so you can watch them at the same time on your mobile phone or laptop. Again, what did we enter here? We entered the repository that contains the description of the operating system image of that device here. We take the master branch of that repository. We tell, hey, we would like to have this configuration here. And finally, this is the identity of this device here. It's a UUID that points to a certain device that is uh, registered on Mender. And of course, we put the checkbox to test the stuff. More often than not, I learned that, uh, well, these Debian guys, they have this golden image approach. They put something on the device. Uh, then they tweak a bit with some bash scripts and maybe some <laughs> handmade commands. And then that's the golden image. Uh, yeah, I must admit that's not so, such a clever approach. Therefore, we start from scratch. And we are using the standard dbootstrap tool to get a minimal root file system. Of course, if you have an x86 CPU, you cannot run this directly on your CPU. So you have to use QMU for emulation. And then we do some additional steps. And here is a difference that, um, of the EDI tool compared to other tools. I'm not using a CH root. Instead, I'm using an LXD container. I put the whole stuff into an LXD container and I don't start systemd. That's also an important thing um, I don't do. So I use dump in it that, that basically nothing starts on this. So I put it you know, to an LX container, I run it without running. And now we need to tweak it a bit. We need to install additional packages. Maybe we need to change some configurations uh, and so on. And for this, I use Ansible. Then, once Ansible is done, uh, we stop the container, we export it. There are some additional tweaks that we get a Mender artifact or uh, an image that you can flash to the device. But finally, we have a complete operating system image, maybe even some documentation of uh, the image as an nice PDF document. So these are the artifacts we get when we end up here. Now we have this image on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, of course, we want to bring it now to Mender, dispatch it to, to the device, uh, and finally test it. And what about testing? We're dealing with IoT devices, so let's treat them as servers. Uh, and there are good tools like Test Infra. Uh, you can easily run the, the PyTest test infra stuff here, and the stuff uh, gets executed or gets uh, done here. Uh, and here I have several examples. So, for instance, I test the root device, whether it got properly resized. Uh, then I check whether it's completed. I check whether the mount points are correct. And another test that I have, it's not depicted here, is uh, just checking. Is systemd properly started? Did all, all services properly start? And you can uh, add as many uh, t uh, tests as you want. So it's really a convenient setup also for testing. 
as you can see, there is no overhead, almost no overhead in writing tests, although you do this remote testing from here to here using SSH. So really worthwhile to look at. One important thing is security. Uh, of course, I don't want to store passwords and so on in the Git repository. Would be bad practice. On GitHub Actions, you can store them as action secrets. And then, uh, you always, whatever step you do, you have to think about how could uh, someone potentially hack you with a pull request and whatnot. And I guess this is pretty properly done on one hand side from GitHub. Then you also have to take care that you read the, the instructions of GitHub, especially if you have a self-hosted runner. So if you have a self-hosted runner, you have to make sure that you have, don't have a public repository, otherwise this would have, uh, by design, uh, uh, it would be insecure. So if you are taking a look at EDIP, EDI-CI repository, there is an EDI-CI and the EDI-CI public repository, and that's just because we have the self-hosted runner down there. So the self-hosted runner connects to the EDCI repository and not to the EDCI public repository. Okay, now we have this operating system image. We can dispatch it to a device, but we have still a dumb headless device. Let's now put the certain use case on the device. And according to the eat your own dog food strategy, I would like to turn the a Raspberry Pi into a GitHub Action Runner. So the GitHub Action Runner we have been using before, I would like to turn it into, uh, um, I would like to do it that stuff automatically. So again, we have an individual device that we would like to manage. As a first step, I enter some values into the Mender configure thing. And this is the playbook I would like to run here. Uh, then which version, in my case it's the main version. Then I have to indicate which repository I would like to connect to and which GitHub account. And I need an access token. Then the configuration artifact makes, makes it down to the self-hosted runner. And here the self-hosted runner, the image that I have put here is a kind of GitOps enabled, I call it. So it knows how to deal with Git and it knows how to deal with Ansible. Then as a third step, the script down here fetches a playbook and analyzes the playbook. Oh, we have to fetch roles and then uh, Ansible starts to execute the whole playbook. We will fetch a runner binary, which is a .NET binary. I don't care about it that much. We fetch it, put it onto the device. We also have to fetch some Debian packages, uh, maybe on top of it. And finally, the runner registers itself to GitHub. So <laughs> we don't just automate the image builds, we'll also automate the infrastructure we need. Okay, how does, for instance, the playbook look like? This is the whole playbook that gets applied and turns my nice device, my Raspberry Pi 4, into a GitHub Action Runner that knows how to deal with EDI. So the two roles I'm applying is Ansible GitHub Action Runner. I'm a lazy guy, so I just took this role from internet. That's the beauty of Ansible. You have a lot of things you can already pull in. Uh, this, so this installed the GitHub Action Runner. And on top of it, I want to enable this device uh, to do some EDI commands in order to build the operating system image. So I created my own EDI installer role and I also pull it in and I uh, apply it. So in the end, we have this uh, runner. That's the final result. The runner registers itself on GitHub. And now we are ready to use that runner. 
Let's give a second example. Let's assume we are a company that does some Kiosk terminals and we would like to turn a headless device into a Kiosk terminal. So first, it's the same procedure, it's just turned by 90 degrees. Uh, we give the playbook that we would like to apply. We tell uh, which version, here it's main, but if you would like to have it fully reproducible, we will probably give a certain version. And here is the URL I would like to display on that Raspberry Pi. So again, the config artifact makes it to the Raspberry Pi. A playbook gets cloned. Some roles get downloaded to the Raspberry Pi using Git. And then the playbook starts. It will install maybe uh, Firefox and Lightium and whatnot. And as a result, we have this Kiosk terminal. So now we have been able to build an operating system image in a fully automatic manner. We have seen how we can tweak individual devices. And now we would like this to apply this to an entire fleet. So this is the demo fleet I have. As said, that's the small fleet at home and the big playground is the Schindler playground. So uh, we start from here. That's a Raspberry Pi 2. It's maybe a legacy device. It has the role of a legacy device. Then here it's a Compiler IoT gateway. It would be, maybe it'd be a great Wi-Fi 6 hotspot. Then we have two Raspberry Pis that are serving as a Kiosk terminal. <coughs> this guy here is a very sideboard. It looks like a development device, early development phase. Then Device number six is the GitHub Action Runner. And finally, we have another Kiosk terminal. So we have different use cases. We have the different devices, and that's the typical environment you have in a company. Okay, how can we now tackle this fleet? Uh, short introduction, very short introduction, one slide about GitOps. So what is GitOps? It's, uh, from my point of view, a new concept buzzword in the IT industry. The goal is to automate as many IT operations as possible. The automation shall be based on a fully declared and versioned target state. Git is usually the tool of choice to store the target state. And a bunch of tools are responsible for applying the target state to the infrastructure. And Last but not least, uh, GitOps is not only applicable within the IT industry, so it also fits perfectly into our world, uh, the embedded world, the IoT world, so we just have to do some things a bit different. For this, I created a Git repository, and now if you're going back to the fleet, we try to attach this fleet to a Git repository, and that's the way we do it. Here we have the develop branch, and we have maybe some feature branches. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, they are not depicted here. Here we develop the stuff. Here and below we develop the stuff. We have a lot of changes. And these changes might go directly to the development device I have shown before. If it breaks, uh, probably the developer will take care of it, but most of the time nobody will notice. If we believe that something is okay, we can merge it to the main branch. And as soon as it is merged to the main branch, it will be dispatched to the Kiosk terminal that is maybe uh, close to the developer uh, office. So still the developers will see if it fails, but not the much more people. And if it still doesn't fail here, then let's merge it to the cannery branch. So these are the canneries that uh, they used in the coal mine. So that's maybe the, the terminal that is at the uh, management building of your company. And if it fails there, um, maybe you get a bit more feedback. But if it still doesn't fail, Let's merge it to the production 
branch and automatically will be applied to all the rest of the fleet. Again, we are doing changes here and above here. No changes anymore, just merges. Looks nice, but how is it being executed behind the scene? So we start here with GitHub. We have a change on a branch. Um, it's a commit on develop. It's a, just a merge on main and above. And GitHub will notice, okay, change on the develop branch, dispatch a job to GitHub. And then on GitHub, I'm again a lazy guy. Uh, I use Ansible here, I execute an Ansible playbook. The Ansible playbook will check, ah, uh, these are the facts about my fleet. It does not ask the devices directly. They might be turned off or whatnot. Uh, so we get the facts of the device. We check, oh, an OS update is required or not, and we dispatch it or not. And maybe we have to update the configuration. So an important thing compared to a typical server word is that, that we have a proxy in between here the management and the fleet. So we don't touch devices directly. How does the job now look like? It's a GitHub Actions job. Um, it can either happen on a push or I can also trigger it manually. It runs on a, on a hosted runner by GitHub and mm -hmm. We check out as a first step the fleet management playbook. Then that's a small thing, small uh, missing part uh, for Ansible. I install this, it doesn't matter at all. But then we play the playbook. And again, we already have a GitHub action that knows how to deal with an Ansible playbook. Now, how does the playbook look like? First of all, there are some, is some checking whether we have the, uh, the right Ansible version. Uh, the fun part happens down here. The first role gathers the fleet facts. And usually you would go directly to the device in order to grab the facts. We don't do this as the devices might be offline. So we gather the facts from Mender in our case. Then the second step is to install an operating system and I'd only do it if the device is subscribed to the branch that is being applied. Then last but not least we apply a configuration and that's the configuration where we turned a device into a kiosk terminal or into a GitHub action runner. And now how does the inventory of the fleet look like. So basically these are just UUIDs uh, of the devices. That's the, the full inventory of the fleet. So in my configuration I have seven UUIDs and that's, that's it. Now we look at an individual device configuration. By default, the devices are subscribed to the production branch. In this case, the device is subscribed to the main branch. I would like to turn it into a Kiosk device. And here is the URL I want to display. That's already everything to tell, hey, I would like to have a Kiosk device. If we look into the details, on whether an operating system update is needed or not. Then we have such a table. We have different device types, Raspberry Pi 2, Pi 3, Pi 4, uh, Varisite device um, and uh, CompuLab device. And here, for instance, uh, it's gonna be a Raspberry Pi 3 or whatnot. And here, then I can see, okay, that's the corresponding image. We can compare again between the stuff we, have, we know from Mender and uh, with the desired state and if it's needed, we apply the update. Two remarks. 
you have maybe noticed that this is kind of a fire and forget approach. So we tell Mender, hey, install this operating system and update this configuration. The devices might be offline and uh, uh, this stuff happens a lot uh, later. Hello? So what is very important is to monitor such a fleet. And this is completely out of scope for this presentation. And one other thing, let's say you have 200, 300, 400,000 devices, you would probably not write the inventory into the Git repository because this would just give a tremendous amount of commits. So the inventory will probably go into a separate database and also the individual device configurations will probably make it into a, a separate database. But for the sake of simplicity, uh, here I've put everything together in one Git repository. So what are the conclusions out of this? One very important thing is that with this approach, everybody is working on the same stuff. It's not like uh, the developers did something and then they wrote the Jira ticket for the ops team hey, please upgrade this, and uh, the product owner has attached an Excel sheet with uh, some versions inside, and then the ops team will maybe or maybe not look at it and uh, dispatch it. So everybody's working on the same repository, talking the same language. Then we have full traceability. We know exactly what made it to, to the main branch, what made it to the canary branch, and what made it to the production branch. You can also do easily diff. Then, beyond the develop branch, we don't introduce any changes anymore. There is, as you can see, a very high level of automation. So almost everything is automated. And uh, what is also an important aspect are the staged rollouts. So first the stuff goes to the canary uh, branch and that then later in time it makes it to the production branch so you don't break the system in one go and like this there are almost no there is almost no room for human errors and on, on the github or a bitbucket or whatnot you can configure who is actually allowed to do the merge, who needs to approve the pull request, and maybe there are not only humans that need to approve it, but also automatic tests, some stuff you get uh, back from the fleet, so the quality should get a lot better. Then we have a powerful toolbox, it's uh, suitable for a huge fleet, so it scales all um, uh, things scale. The components are proven in use. It's fun to work with. And last but not least, you can change almost every component. If you don't like Debian, take Yocto. If you don't like Ansible, take Solstack. If you don't like GitHub, take GitLab. If you don't like Mender, take Soft SW Update. If you don't like Python, use Go. So every component is exchangeable. Here is kind of the stuff behind the scene, what kind of Git repository. So uh, the title was Automating and Managing an IoT Fleet Using Git. So here are the Git repositories that were used uh, behind the scene. First, we have this orchestration stuff for the CI, stuff, for the CI pipeline. Then we have three different repositories for the operating system images. So for the Raspberry Pi, for the Verisite, and for the CompuLab. This is for the continuous integration. For the device management, we have playbooks and roles. So we have the, we've seen the Kiosk playbook that takes the role Ansible Kiosk. We have the uh, GitHub Runner uh, playbook that fetches um, a role from somewhere from GitHub and the one that I've written by myself. And last but not least, if you want to manage the entire fleet, we have this EDCD repository that does the continuous delivery. 
So that's also maybe a side note. All of the stuff that I'm presenting here is open source. You can uh, take a look at it. Uh, you can dig into the details. That's not a problem. Here are a few links. So I've written several blog posts about this stuff. Uh, they also go a bit more into the details. And uh, finally, I hope that the presentation was unclear enough that there are still a few questions. So we should still have some time left for questions. Yes, please. Yes. One thing I didn't fully follow is, is on the Raspberry Pi, is there a kit client that, that holds the repository? To, uh, that's what they do in a Kubernetes cluster, where the controller lives within the cluster and con continuously monitoring the different repositories. Okay. For security reasons, they, they have moved from push to pull. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, I tried to move back to the slide here, and I'm supposed to repeat the question for the external audience. Um, I think this could be a good, good slide here. So the question is whether this device down here operates in push or pull mode. Maybe I have to switch even a few more slides back. So, uh, this was actually the action runner. Are you more interested in the setup of the action runner? Yeah, probably I'm mixing up something. <laughs> yeah, so this would be the setup of the action runner. And here, uh, I'm reusing the Mender configure thing. So, here, down here, we have a Mender client running, and this Mender client pulls Mender, and actually the configuration artifact is pulled down here, like with Kubernetes. It's pulled down here and then uh, the artifact gets unpacked and a, sh a very small shell script gets executed and the shell script then does a git clone down here, so also pull uh, and uh, pull some roles and that's how it is uh, executed. Does Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's a good question. So the question is how? Let's say you do this merge here. Yeah. You do this, and how does this propagate to the fleet? Now I go here, so we have the merge here, and then uh, as a trigger, this triggers a job, run on a GitHub action runner, a hosted one. The GitHub action runner compares the fleet facts taken from Ender with the, uh, the desired state, sees, oh, we have to upgrade the operating system, then it schedules, that's what I meant with just fire and forget, it schedules an update here on Mender. And then we have again Mender client that is polling for updates. So because most of the time we have a barrier here, either because of some networking, of wired network or of the MNO, so we cannot push something. So the, the IoT device is always uh, work in pull mode. And that's also implemented here by means of Mender on top of Mender. It has the nice side effect uh, because I do the configuration artifacts and uh, the, the OS updates both over Mender, so they are nicely synchronized. It, does, it cannot be that the OS artifact um, kind of messes up with a configuration update. Okay, are there other questions? Yes. How large is the largest fleet you have uh, working at this point? 
So, I must say this is a bit ahead of what we do at Schindler. So, for this setup, it's seven devices. Thank you. Um, at Schindler, we have a really huge fleet, so 100,000 of devices. So, it, that's also why I mentioned here, such things would need to be offloaded into a separate database, but this is perfectly possible with Ansible. And you can also group by country, you can group by device type, you can group by whatever you want. Further questions? Eric? How do you bootstrap the first device in the initial seed with the memory IO? Aha, so let's uh, go here. So the question is how we get such a device alive down here for the first time. So what I need to do here is that if it's a Raspberry Pi, I need to flash a complete image to the, comp uh, to the flash card and it's a, a reduced image that get, gets expanded during the first boot and then registers on Mender and then we have a new UUID. We have to enter this UUID into the fleet management repository. Uh, that's how it happens here. On this device, um, I don't even recall it uh, exactly how to uh, do it. I have not done it for a long time. On other devices we have at Schindler we use UUU, so this NXP tool. Uh, then there are uh, Android uh, Flash for Rock Chip. So it depends. But we always make sure that we have a complete image, including bootloader, that we flash to the device. So the, the output of the, of the chain I've shown here. is not only an artifact that uh, can be updated over the air, it's not only the Mender artifact, but it's also alongside it uh, documentation and this big artifact that makes it initially uh, to the device uh, during uh, uh, factory setup. Does this answer the question? Thank you. Are there other questions? If not, we can finish on time, almost on time, yeah? Uh, and uh, if you would like to see live demo, how it really works, uh, you can of course contact me. I'm still here till Friday, lunchtime. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>